Very good evening. Welcome here um, at uh, the Buren. My name is uh, Ulrich Seldeslacht. I'm uh, Flemish. I'm uh, a little bit representing the, the Belgian Federation today, but I'm the moderator of this evening, so I'll try to be on neutral grounds and sitting over there in that chair. And we have um, an interesting panel uh, that we collected for you tonight uh, that will be talking about um, cybersecurity challenges. Um, while my speakers over there, my panelists are being um, wired up, as uh, we call it. Uh, it's called wired up, but I don't know why, because they're all wireless microphones, but anyways. So I'll um, ask them whenever they're ready to come forward and to take uh, a seat here in uh, the assigned uh, chairs. So um, to get this uh, uh, debate started, I want to just mention to you a couple of words. Uh, this activity tonight has been set up together with the Buren, uh, but also together with um, uh, Privacy Salon, which is an, uh, a non-for-profit organization that is organizing a very large conference that, as you can see here, still from my batch, um, is today and the next two days happening here in Brussels. It's, uh, it's collecting more than 1,000 um, attendees, experts in privacy, in all sorts of uh, uh, concepts and relations. And one of those topics is, of course, um, the relationship between uh, privacy and, and cybersecurity. Uh, one hot topic also to be debated. Um, the uh, other organization that is involved, that's uh, our own organization, which is called ELSEC. That's a not-for-profit um, association uh, also from Belgium. And uh, we represent uh, more than 300 members, which are uh, IT security, cybersecurity industry, research, and also enterprise. And we reach out to more than uh, 25,000 uh, IT security professionals in Belgium, the Netherlands mainly, but also Luxembourg, Germany, and UK. So when, since the last 15 years or so, we have been actively working on cybersecurity issues and uh, having been organizing these types of debates like the one for tonight, mainly towards the public of um, actually also professionals in cybersecurity. So just to get a little bit of sense of feeling here for tonight, how many of you are cybersecurity professionals, one way or another, uh, doing research or uh, being involved? We have one, we have one, we have two, um, any more? Okay, so we have two, that's, that's interesting. Uh, lady and gentlemen, please come forward. Um, and while you're doing this, I'll, I'll just um, keep the, uh, the spirit going here. How many of you have um, had actually a cybersecurity incident happening um, at, uh, at your environment, at your place? Either in your one, two, three, four-ish, five, six, seven, okay, eight. So, okay, um, approximately um, one, one, one third, I would say, of, of this public. And um, just to get a, a bit of a, a sense of feeling, um, can, can you explain, and, and I think there's a wireless microphone in addition as well. Um, so I, I saw a hand over there. Uh, yep, yeah, you're going to have it. Um, can, can you explain a bit what your cybersecurity issue was that, that you had? <coughs> there's a microphone over there, so it's uh, coming in your direction. Hi everybody, so my name is Silvana, I'm an information architect working on the digital transformation of the European Commission. Uh, this is something that I experienced actually in my personal life. It's someone who sort of took control of my laptop, I was trying to stream something online, uh, not as legal as it is in this country, to be honest. Uh, but uh, it's just someone who sort of uh, just had a remote access to my laptop, and just blocked everything there. I had to be on the phone with this person. Okay. And uh, they sort of asked me to pay something, but because it was my work laptop, um, I said, okay, well, I don't think that's gonna happen. <laughs> and uh, and uh, yeah, and it was just weird actually, because you had no control over anything on your laptop. And so you have, I had all my work on there and that was really, that was really scary. But because I did not agree to pay, they just uh, let it off the hook. And I think there's only a period of time that they're on the phone with you. Yeah. This means uh, they, they know they're sort of being tracked. And so I tried to keep them on the phone as long as possible. And actually, then I got in touch with someone from, um, from our course, from Cyber Wayfinder, uh, to ask for assistance on this. Okay. And so, yeah. Right, very interesting. So that puts us in the middle of the, uh, uh, of the issue. Thank you very much for that uh, enlightening uh, uh, idea. And, and I hope that in the end it got resolved uh, as well. So, right. Uh, so then you get back to the commission and then basically you start spreading the virus that they <laughs> put on your machine. Okay, ex excellent. So you, you, gave, you gave the industry a bit of work. Excellent, thank you so much. 
Um, excellent. So I think that that explains a bit uh, the spirit of um, what we are seeing today and definitely also what we've seen over the last year. So I'm not going to go over all of the different cybersecurity challenges that, that are there. Uh, we'll be talking about a number of them tonight. Uh, in any case, uh, we can go from, from the most recent ones to probably the ones that have been happening uh, over decades. I think the most recent one that's uh, bugging us all, um, things like Spectre and Meltdown. Did, did anybody of you hear about it? Spectre, Meltdown? Yeah, you should. <laughs> Eddie, you should. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, well, of, of course. <laughs> and, and then uh, left and right, a couple of hands going up. Um, so yeah, basically that was a, um, uh, a sort of a mistake, let's put it this way, at, uh, to, to make it very polite. Uh, in the chips, um, in the chips that uh, we are using in our PCs that are causing actually, yeah, uh, probably some data leakages if we put them to the test and, and using them actually as, as we would like them to do, namely uh, going very speedy and doing lots of processing at the same time. So that was actually, I think, one of the most recent ones. Um, of course, 2017 was uh, very much the year of the ransomware attacks like the one that uh, you just mentioned. So uh, we've seen many of those happening in very forms and, and factors, um, and we expect them to come back uh, in 2018 even stronger and better. And I think um, yeah, throughout the course of uh, the last year, also what we've seen, which is maybe something that should uh, put us to, to the test of uh, actually also the democracy, uh, are things whereby potentially Russian hackers might potentially interfere with elections and with the um, uh, just the normal ways of going into uh, the democracy, either in the US or in France or in Germany or in any other um, uh, country in, uh, uh, in Europe. But maybe not only uh, Russia, because that's maybe potentially uh, the case. Um, there was also, of course, the uh, assumption that North Korea was somewhere involved. Um, but maybe the nation states are uh, not always too, too far-fetched, uh, in the sense that a couple of years ago, even here in Belgium, if uh, some of you might remember, we had the attack against um, the international arm of, uh, of Proximus, of Belhacom, and which uh, actually was caused by uh, the, the British uh, intelligence services. And so many of those types of attacks uh, we've seen happening over the past couple of years and will likely come back. So without further ado, let me now start by introducing uh, our panel here, and ladies first, of course. Um, and you can, of course, uh, introduce a little bit more about yourselves later on. Uh, but just to go from uh, right to, to left in this case, so uh, Natalie um, is here today because she represents also a group of um, cybersecurity women and cyber women, uh, which I think is a, is a very um, noble thing to do as well. But in the day-to-day -day operations, uh, she's part of the, uh, the Belgian Cybersecurity uh, Center. Um, so it's the Cybersecurity Coordination Center that has been around since uh, just over two years and a half now. Um, trying to coordinate uh, many of the cybersecurity challenges that the Belgian government and uh, Belgium as a, as a country are facing. Then uh, Simon um, is uh, VP Privacy and Security at uh, TomTom, um, which, as most of us know, is uh, the GPS that we are all using, aren't we? Yes, of course. Um, <laughs> so all customers of, of you here, uh, Simon. And then um, Martin, um, uh, so Simon and uh, Martin are, are Dutch representatives uh, tonight. Um, Martin is uh, uh, general manager at uh, Philips uh, Security, has been with, uh, with Philips for um, a couple of decades, I think, is it, Martin? <laughs> um, well. But uh, he's, he's mastering all of the Philips um, uh, appliances that we have at home, and then mainly, I think, uh, with a general interest in, in healthcare uh, appliances as well. So um, I think all of us are using Philips, so all of your customers are sitting here as well. And then um, last but definitely not least is uh, Eddie Willems. Um, Eddie Willems is, I think, one of the most uh, representative figures of the cybersecurity industry here in Belgium because he uh, represents uh, G-Data on a day-to-day -day basis um, in, uh, at, at international television stations such as uh, CNN. And so he goes worldwide with the latest and greatest on, uh, on viruses and, uh, and cybersecurity threats. So. Um, I would say uh, maybe in a first um, uh, stage, and that's the way that we sort of organized this panel for tonight, there's actually three main topics. Um, the first one is the what, the cybersecurity challenges. I named a couple of them, uh, so to get those off the table. Uh, but there's a couple of others as well. And so um, I'll first uh, uh, ask the different panelists 
to give a, a little bit of perspective of what they found as uh, cybersecurity challenges, and I suggested a couple of them to them. Um, the second part is um, going to be the, um, the who, uh, who's actually dealing with these, uh, uh, with these things and, and who can actually do something with the challenges that we are facing today. So, um, um, and the third component is how possibly are we able to, to resolve the cybersecurity challenges uh, here in Europe that we're facing. So that's the outline for, uh, for the next uh, hour and, and, and 15 minutes or so. And then um, it was promised to me, so therefore to you, that afterwards uh, a drink will be available for you to, um, uh, to continue the discussions and conversations. So, um, but if you have any questions in the meantime, then please raise your hand. And uh, if there's an issue that uh, any of those uh, lady or gentlemen uh, of topics that uh, might want to address, uh, please raise your hand and, and we'll um, uh, be happy to answer your questions and, and comments. Okay. So, uh, Natalie, you're, again, uh, ladies first uh, for tonight. Let's uh, maybe start with you. What do you see as the, the biggest cybersecurity challenges um, uh, happening today here in Europe? Um, thanks, Ulrich, by the way, for the introduction. Um, I'll give a little word more about uh, who I am, what I do. So I work for the National Cybersecurity Center uh, of Belgium. We're the national coordination organ, but I'm not speaking on behalf of the center. Um, but since I am uh, responsible for expertise in the center, I will be speaking from my experiences um, as my, um, in, in my job. Um, so what I see as, as the biggest challenges are on the more human level. Uh, I think we'll go more into the strategic and, and um, physical infrastructure problems. Um, but the problems we see mostly is um, you, the humans, the people <laughs> who have issues, um, but also the people who have questions, the people who want to know how to secure themselves. Um, and the biggest problem we have with this is there's such a big knowledge gap between the people who kind of already know what's happening. Uh, like Silvana already knew like, okay, this is a remote access tool. You can already Google some things. You know how to ask your question even. But there's people who don't even know what's happening. There's people who don't even know that they're being attacked, that their computer is infected with viruses. And as not just a government, but as a society, it's such a big problem to find a way to communicate to everyone. Our digital society has become such a rapid evolution, and some people are on the outside of this vortex, and they're having such a hard time getting more into the center, because it's moving so fast. Um, so I honestly think it's, it's important that we get people to that same knowledge level. Not everyone needs to become a hacker. Um, we, we are also lacking in expertise, but we need to make people know what a hacker does. We don't need to teach people how to use rainbow tables to crack a password, but people need to know how a password is cracked. You know, If uh, a hacker uses a dictionary attack, he runs through an entire dictionary of words within seconds and matches your password with it. And if you know this, you know how to create a strong password. So this is one of our biggest challenges, that people don't even know what's going on behind that computer. We don't, we don't know what we're even vulnerable to. We don't know what the threats are, and we don't know what to protect us against. Um, so challenge number one, us all as a vulnerable person. But challenge number two is that we are all connected. So even my grandma is a problem if she gets infected, because if she sends an email to me, which is, could be a phishing email, I might have the chances are of me opening it are faster than someone else opening it because it's my grandma, I trust her. So everyone is a vector and this, this whole problem of us being connected, people ask all the time like, oh, why should I care about my security? Well, you can be a gateway to a network. So these are some of the <coughs> problems we see. Um, and then other than that, it's also the fact that we just lack in experts. Now we're, we're sitting up here, uh, I consider myself the, the new generation, um, but women have been so underrepresented in the technology field, and it's even going down. It's not even getting better. In 2012, uh, the percentage of women in cybersecurity was 11%, now it's 7% in Europe. So we haven't even improved, we've only gotten worse. And there's such a whole potential of women, like a whole untapped resource. Um, and this is the program that we are in. Uh, it's, it's picking us up from a level of, of being interested in cybersecurity and making us into professionals. And we have courses every day, but uh, it's, it's one of the, the biggest problems we see, a lack of experts and a 
whole lot of people in different fields who could be part of that um, knowledge base. So some challenges, some solutions already. Okay, uh, thank you, Natalie. Um, fr from a previous experience, um, uh, which was an, an more uh, part of an, an, an academic uh, institution, KU Leuven, um, I think you've organized also a number of um, educational courses. What did you notice there as sort of the, um, uh, the, the challenges uh, in training people, in trying to, because it's, it's a very complex um, topic as well as cybersecurity. You have to really go deep to understand what the different challenges are. Uh, and, and maybe also for yourself, uh, how, how did you basically train and educate yourself? Well, I think we also organize courses for uh, government staff right now, for all the federal government. And again, the biggest problem is the knowledge gap and assessing where people are. Because it's not a problem that people are in the lower gap, it's just having a baseline and knowing where to start. And it's the same for us as well. I, I really had to kind of start everywhere, starting on Linux commands and starting on some basic uh, port scanning and, and simple penetration testing labs. But it's, it's such a wide area because security of IT is about IT first. So you need to know the IT before you can se secure it. But it kind of goes in, in a, 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 what's it called again, like a, a self-fulfilling prophecy where, mm -hmm. you know, a catch-22. You need to know security before you can secure the IT. You need to know IT before you can secure it, so. Right. So, so in, 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 in your case then, uh, how did you start to get deeper into, into the matter? <laughs> Uh, have you been trained uh, uh, on this uh, formally, or um, did you basically learn it uh, uh, as you went by? So personally, I um, wrote my thesis on cyber war, so it was more about the interstate uh, effects, and it bugged me that I didn't know what these attacks were. So we were talking about Stuxnet, uh, a worm in, uh, that was planted in an Iranian uh, nuclear plant. Uh, it was the first virus that actually caused physical damage. So it was very important because it was uh, proclaimed to be by the Americans in Iran, so two political actors. But what this virus did, how exactly it caused such a physical damage, I didn't understand. So this is kind of how I got more into it. I started to read what exactly causes this. So, you know, I got more into like, what is a SCADA system? It's a remote access of industrial control, et cetera. Like Spectre and, and Meltdown, the, the hardware, um, uh, vulnerabilities we just discovered, I would try to read it and just be like, okay, I understand half of the text, so I'm just gonna Google everything that until I understand it deeper. So every time there's a new attack or there's a new vulnerability, I try to read up on it. Right. So a definitive interest uh, that, that start growing on you. Okay, thank you so much. Um, we'll get back to, uh, to some of the how to do things about this uh, later on. Um, Simon, um, you, you're dealing with uh, lots of data on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, you're, you're collecting lots of data from uh, the environment, geographical data. You're collecting data from people using the devices and, and actually trying to update their maps and, and uh, mm -hmm. activities. So as, as VP of both security and, and, and privacy, how do you match the two together? Um, well, in a way, uh, they belong to each other. You cannot have privacy without security. Uh, but in order to do security properly, you sometimes have to intrude and interfere with privacy. So it, you can't have one without the other. They go together. Uh, and uh, so it is not like it is a zero-sum game. There is not such a thing as a balance. It needs to be achieved both. And, and, and privacy for me is about... Um, how you respect individuals while you use their data. My, my mic seems to be yeah. not functioning. Let me... Maybe it's off? No, it's on. Use this. Okay. Well, let me stash this away. So, um, privacy and security belong together. And, uh, and, and privacy is, is largely about uh, respect for private life reflected in how, in our case, how we use the data. So it's about responsible ethical use of data, and while you do that, you need to make sure that it is not misused by us or by others, and this is where security kicks in. So, but in order to assess whether something has happened, you may want to have a look at what people have done to make sure it was okay and it was not someone else. So this is how that, that kind of fits together. Um, but, but actually, the what to us, 
so, so you know us from, from the navigation devices, obviously. So in, in 2004, they came to market, and they were just standalone. So what could go wrong? You know, they were not connected to the internet. But in 2008, we put them on the internet. We put them in the internet to receive uh, traffic information in real time. So you get the traffic jams on your device, and they were connected. And that opened up an avenue for, well, others to also go into that device. So we had to protect that re re really early on. Uh, and, and, and actually, um, uh, and this is a story which you can find in a way on the internet, but I haven't told it before, but we had the situation in which an Israeli company uh, called Celebrite found a way to crack into our protected systems. So they were able to crack into the encryption we did on that device in order to protect the data. And the way we found out was because there were all of a sudden advertising, if you want to know where your wife has been, send us your device and we'll, we'll, we'll tell you. So what happened is that our device happened to have a software bug, a feature, not well implemented encryption, which these Israeli company, which offers their service as, uh, as forensic tools, were able to crack that data. So what did we do? We sent out an update and it was resolved. But it shows that already, this was a really 2010, at that time, these kinds of events happened. So the what is not necessarily just hackers or you being stupid. It is also, there is really an incentive sometimes for people, an economic incentive or a let's say, state-related incentive or just a regular crime enforcement incentive to gain access to your data, which may look like a security uh, issue, which you can see as is, but it could also be legitimate. So it is not easy for us, being continuously under attack for all kinds of services, to detect whether... So what's happening? So it kind of gives you a bit of a gist of the problem. Your microphone should is it working? Am I working? Yeah, yeah, it's okay. You're working. <laughs> Good, I'm working. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so thank you for that also. Um, yeah, I think uh, that was definitely one of the cases that, uh, that, that I wanted to, to discuss with you, obviously. So in, in that sense, um, what were the key learnings there for, for you and, and for the organization? Because um, you, you are dealing with a lot of uh, sensitive data from your customers. Um, so, so, in order to protect that, what we do is that we, as soon as we receive that data, basically sever the link with you. So it just becomes data that cannot be related back to you. So that's a very core protective measure because uh, even if someone stole that data, we make it hard to steal the data, but then it would uh, be very difficult, next to impossible, to relate that back to you. So that's, that's a protective measure. Now, we also have services in which that doesn't happen. So we also have services in which devices uh, for, 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 let's say, uh, we call that fleet <coughs> management, so uh, money transport vans get embedded into the car, and then we don't uh, anonymize the data severing because it's intentional that our customer, which is the money delivery company, wants to know where these vehicles are. So then there is a lot of... Uh, uh, protective measures which, which are into the hardware, which are into the way we engineer the systems, we test them for security vulnerabilities, we have vulnerability scanning, we have, uh, of course, firewalls, but it's also intelligent firewalls that can detect specific uh, threats, and there's a regular process to also verify uh, whether new uh, vulnerabilities have been discovered that affect us. So the latest one was indeed Spectre and Meltdown, uh, uh, which is a tough one because it's very much at the heart of the processors. Uh, but luckily, our processors that we have in our devices aren't affected, so that, that's okay. Uh, we were lucky. That's uh, sometimes, we are actually quite often we say, so we are lucky this time, others aren't. Because um, the issue is, it's like the weather. All of a sudden, it starts to, to rain, a, a thunderstorm, and hopefully you have the protection where others, others may not have. Right. Thank you very much, uh, Simon. So, Martin, um, explain a bit uh, also from, from your perspective in, within Philips uh, what, what, uh, what your role is and uh, how being general manager for, for um, the security, what that entails and, and how you actually uh, 
have inputs on, on the products and the developments that uh, Philips makes. I'm not the general manager of security in Philips. Let's get that out of the way. <laughs> I'm only working on security technologies. And, and I think that's also um, what you see is that uh, Philips, uh, I mean Royal Philips, which means we do the healthcare side of Philips, um, we're looking now at, uh, at care systems that are no longer confined to a single home or a single hospital, but you want to really manage your health throughout your life. So uh, we call that connected care and the care cycle, whether you're in the hospital or on the home or on the move, you should be able to have care. And for that, there's a lot of devices, there are typically large expensive devices in the hospital, but then there are also the typical I internet of things devices that you have at home or maybe when you're on the move you have something wearable and so that has first of all it has a, a large uh, a management challenge like uh, everybody can uh, just get such IOT device and, and study it in a lab until they break it um, and we found out that that uh, right now if you the state of the art is that most of the time they can break into your system given time and the winters in, in, in certain parts of the world are very long um, so that you will actually get very hard attacks uh, on your systems uh, and these are very low cost devices very often so it's very difficult to defend against that so my role in Philips is to look at can we find solutions to make our system stronger from a technical perspective and yeah, because you're saying well it's, it's all about the people one of the issue with these people is that they don't spend enough time on making the technology stronger. There are not that many organizations that work on that full time. It's universities and then some companies. But if you look at the economic landscape in Europe, that's actually rather limited. Um, and yeah, maybe that's also sometimes, for example, because uh, uh, security has to be free. Uh, we, we download open SSL for free and you get what you pay for. So that the, the, the amount of people that really work on security technologies themselves is rather limited actually. So that's what we said, well, you know, this is something where we want to play an additional role. We want good security solutions that don't make our systems ridiculously expensive. Uh, and so that's where we work. But you, I think the main challenge that we have, I think you said, well, you know, we were lucky, we were unlucky. So there seems to be very little you can rely on that you can get from the market. If we want to build a good healthcare device, what should we buy that we can really rely on? I don't think there's anything in the market. And that's the issue. I mean, whether you buy an Infineon chip and then you read in that they make a mistake or you, you think, you know what, you cannot fill with number one, you buy an Intel chip and now it turns out you have an issue there. And, and frankly, this is every month. There's not been a single month without such zero. Can, can you so that, that for me is the, the biggest issue. Can you elaborate a little bit more on, on, on uh, if you say, what, what we can rely on, what we buy? Um, we're talking about healthcare devices that you're selling to hospitals. So those are large systems. Yeah. And they are composed of the very different elements and components. And um, is, is that what you mean? So you're and, and so we are faced with the fact that we have a large healthcare system of many components and we have to assume that each and every one of these components at any moment can suddenly fail, not due to what we did, but just because, you know, some researcher or whatever event. And so we or think... Or, or a chip that breaks down, that melts down. Well, melt, yeah, well, melt, the, the thing is, if it breaks, I mean, okay, it breaks, but meltdown is like... It was in there for many years and eh? nobody says that meltdown hasn't been misused for 20 years, we just don't know. So, but you can be confronted as an organization suddenly with, hey, this de device, which cost, I don't know, 2 million <coughs> euro to buy, is supposed to last for 15 years, suddenly the core of it is, uh, is end of life, right? And now what? So that, so, yeah, I, uh, right now I think for Philips the only way to deal with that is to focus really mu very much on the processes to handle these events. So security is a process, that's a well-known thing, and that is, a, that is very true. So <coughs> there we have done a lot of work in life cycle maintenance of all these devices, especially I think for the, for the more expensive devices. is actually not that difficult because you can indeed combine it with break and fix, which you have to do anyway. 
But if you're looking at, let's say, home devices, which are hardly managed, I mean, there is, there is no professional there to call you when things break down. And a consumer might not even know he's hacked. So how are you going to manage those things from a distance when these events come in? That's a, that's a, it's a real challenge. Eh? So frankly, I think we, we will be in this situation where there will be a new thing in the news for suddenly will be for some time. One of the things that personally I find quite disturbing if I talk to uh, professors in the university uh, that, that really work on cybersecurity, they say, look, I cannot build a secure system. And if, if the professor can't even do it, then we can educate the people here in the room what we want. But the teacher doesn't know. Okay. So, should we then simply not be cyber or not be connected? That's what the professor says. He says, <laughs> you can do it on paper, do it on paper. In the Netherlands, we went back to paper, <laughs> paper ballot. <laughs> so, I think what we should, as uh, from a policy perspective, uh, digitization has huge advantages. We should grab them. Uh, but we should be realized that it comes with a cost and we need to pay the price. Yeah? And the price is you need to deal with the cybersecurity issues and if you don't include that in your budget, you will still <coughs> pay the cost later and you will be confronted with things you can, cannot manage. So uh, there, there are examples enough, I think, of companies that uh, bring, I don't know, a mobile phone to market and stop supporting uh, security after one or two years. And even big companies do that. Nah, yeah. You should, when you bring a new uh, product to market, have a product plan that includes patches for the economic lifetime of that product. That should be normal. Uh, and, and of course, yeah, that has an, an economic impact, probably. Okay, let's uh, come back to that um, uh, later in any case. But um, do you think it's really realistic that we go back to, let's say, the Stone Age in, in this way? I I see Eddie nodding, so let's, let's go over to, to Eddie. Well, it's completely impossible. <laughs> well, I heard, I heard today that there's still a chance of an atomic war, so who knows, but no, obviously not. But you can, you, uh, you can per application decide what level of automation do you need. And even if you're going to automate, how are you going to do that? There are lots of different ways. I read in the news that 50% of all Norwegians had part of their health care data, uh, uh, data stolen in one hack. Mm -hmm. Maybe we should say, let's not bring more than 10% of the data together in one place, such that at least they need five hacks to get to 50%. Yeah, so, and I think also in your case, uh, you say, look, we have anonymized the data. So the way you structure how you store your large data lakes, there's lots of choices there, and you need to make the right one. Adi, explain us a little bit more uh, your role and, and GData also, and then... Yeah. Uh, my role, I'm a security evangelist, meaning that I speak to a lot of publics, actually. Um, so, ranging from experts to media to, yeah, what I call normal people. Um, so, um, you. <laughs> Happy to be here, thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's... that's um, anyway, um, so, my thing is that I try to explain all those difficult things in, in layman's words, but it, it's, it's very difficult actually. And, and that's also, but also you said, of course, it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's reaching the human uh, uh, behind. But what we of course do, uh, because I'm not um, going to say that much about that uh, part. Anyway, I, I'm representing actually GData, which is actually a, a security company, actually an antivirus vendor. And I'm also representing, actually, uh, because I'm on the board of several security organizations, um, um, also more or less the security industry over here. I can tell you, we are defending you. Um, <laughs> um, is there somebody over here who doesn't have an antivirus product installed on their system? And dares to admit. One guy, <laughs> okay, possibly. Okay, it possibly doesn't have a PC or so, I think, but anyway. Or a Mac user. <laughs> um, so, you know, that's the real, yeah, you see, you are defended by us. And what you only see or what you hear in the news is only the top of the iceberg. Do you know how many 
threat, well, threat is not a, uh, not a good word. Do you know how many malware samples there are at this moment? Over a million. It's a question, yeah? <laughs> how many malware samples do we have ranging eh, in, in total? Any, any ID? Millions, yes. Well, at this moment, I looked it up this, this morning, we have over 720 million malware out there. So give, give a little bit more of an example of what a malware sample actually yes, is. Yes, what a malware sample is, of course, of course. A malware sample is, you know, what we've heard in the beginning of this talk, ransomware. Huh? Um, malware which is, putting, is, is put on your system and is asking for money to, to give it free again because it encrypts your data and, and yeah, you're completely lost at that moment. Um, so that's, that's one malware sample. So if you heard about WannaCry, that's one sample. And that's what you see in, and what you hear in the news and it's, it's only the top of the iceberg. Um, so if somebody says, wow, this is a big thing, I always say, yeah, well, this is one of them. <laughs> and of course it's a big thing because it's visible and it, it is spreading, it was spreading, of course, very heavily at that moment because it was using some, well, <laughs> some exploit actually from, well, from the NSA. You know, from the NSA. So this is something which was found, of course, and was being used before for spying or for different kind of things. Um, so, and, and this is becoming a problem. And this is becoming a big challenge even for us. You know, in the beginning, uh, when we were playing with all those kind of things, uh, you know, in the beginning when I was, I, when I was starting with these kind of, 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 of um, um, defense mechanism and when we tried to, de to build it inside our products, you know, that was uh, 1986, 1987, think about that. Well, at that moment, it was only script kiddies and just people playing with those kind of things. At this moment, it's completely major, you know. We have professionals behind those tools. We have professional behind, I call it tools these days. We have professionals behind the malware, behind the cyber threats. Uh, and the problem is as well, is that we see that uh, a lot of the problems are also coming from, well, state agencies, which are, you know, um, creating also malware to spy or whatever, or do other kind of stuff. And those things we seem also to detect. And after a while, we seem to know or we seem to try to find out what is this? Oh, damn, this could be from a state agency because this is built to, well, th this couldn't be a script kid. This couldn't be a, a guy on his own. This must be a complete team behind it. So what we see, and if something like that gets in the wild or leaked or was leaked into the public, then, of course, it will be misused and it will be used as a sample, as it will be used as an example to create new malware, which is, of course, completely more sophisticated than what we saw before. This is our global challenge. This is the problem which we are looking into the next years. I'm, I'm, I'm not, you know, exaggerating this. This is the hard, this is the real thing. Of course, we all have other kind of typical stuff like the typical moment, the typical kind of ransomware we see each day, for instance, because we see still a lot of ransomware. WannaCry, was it really ransomware? I call it pseudo ransomware. What is pseudo ransomware? Well, it looks like ransomware in the beginning, but afterwards, if you look at it, you think, hmm, could there maybe somebody other behind it? Was it not maybe created to create some havoc in some part of the world? Not Patia, for instance, was another kind of malware, which we found as well a, a couple of months later on. And that was, well, it, it was creating a lot of problems in, in Ukraine. Think about which country could be behind it. It is very difficult for us, as the security industry, as a company, to say that who is behind that malware. I'm now saying something we 
could be saying that there are some, maybe some involvement or of Russia in some way, or could be some involvement of North Korea from in WannaCry. But who can really say that? It is very, very difficult to have evidence of that. So this is another problem we also see. So we can say a lot of things about a lot of, of a lot of lot of malware, a lot of threats, but also to find the real evidence behind it and to state that this agency, that country, that group is behind it is at this moment completely rubbish because we can't do that always. Um, so. Those are the challenges we see, and of course, one of the challenges we have every day, because we have now 720 million, and we have every day more than 400,000 malware samples um, that we are trying to, um, uh, well, yeah, to get to us. And, and, and for those 400,000 new uh, samples, that's something we try to put in our products, and so we are defending you, all your PCs, against more than. 400,000 new samples each day. So we see that's a lot. Um, that's the other challenge, of course, we have every day, every second. To, to, to get the usual elephant out of the room, um, the usual question, isn't the security industry creating <laughs> those samples? Oh my God, this is, of course, possibly one of the most uh, <laughs> Questions I always get. Uh, the most know, hated question. <laughs> the most hated question. Actually, you know, analyzing uh, samples and creating products for it, it's not the same thing as, of course, creating it. Um, so, no, of course not. And we don't have the time actually to do that as well. Um, we, we don't even have the time to defend uh, us quite well. If you see all those attacks, if we see those attacks, then we didn't do our job quite well. Actually, but can you elaborate a little bit more, um, Eddie? Uh, because we're, you're now talking also again about the security industry, and I think the security industry is important on on how to deal with the challenge. Um, yes. So, how do do you do that, and and who are we talking about that does this? Um, is this a group of um, uh, the usual hoodie type um, guys behind their PCs from? 7 a.m. in the morning until <laughs> 7 a.m. in the morning, and somewhere in between they go and eat pizzas and stuff. So basically the type of hackers that we have in front of us as a sort of an image. The guys who are defending you? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Mm, yes and no. Um, of course, we have a lot of people working inside our company. Um, those people are sometimes yeah, looking a little bit like that. So uh, we very strange guys uh, also working uh, for our company. but. Um, of course, they, you know, they know a lot about security. They know a lot about coding. They know a lot about, uh, you know, uh, the threats which are coming to us. What we did, of course, is of course we created automa uh, automated systems because it's impossible to to help you out with, with with those threats. And and if we have just humans analyzing and creating some kind of tools for you, that's impossible. So of course we have people. Um, uh, and, and of course in teams, and um, they created, of course, auto uh, automated tools for this. So if we receive all those kind of things, um, um, uh, then... How, how do you receive those? Oh, yeah, well, we, uh, we have honeypots, we have email, of course, we have crawlers on the web, meaning that we have some kind of, it's like Google, you know, so which is actually going around uh, on, on all the websites and try to find out if there is something malicious on the website. And, and the honeypot, that's sort of uh, Winnie the Pooh alike? or It's something like that, yeah. It doesn't taste like honey, but it's something f very similar. It tries to attract those, um, yeah, those hackers or eventually guys who are creating viruses or other malware. And also, we also get uh, new stuff just from customers or from other companies because, yeah, but that's something I will maybe say later about the security industry. But anyway, uh, so we get from a lot of sources, we get the malware, and if we get the malware, what we do with it is we just running it on a lot of systems automa uh, automatically, and then we try to find out if it does something malicious. If it does something malicious, we try to deal with it and we try to find what we call well, some kind of signature. It's not a signature what you think it is, but it's a signature which is created actually for detecting maybe 100 samples or whatever. 
something very simpler to all those kind of malware. And that's how we deal with it. And then we put it inside our products. And <coughs> how we do it, uh, how we put it in our products is quite easy. It's just by updating the products automatically. And that's, of course, <coughs> the basic functionality of every kind of uh, security product. Right. It's just an automated uh, uh, update mechanism. Yeah. Yeah. So it continuously investigates against uh, potentially yeah. new threats that came in. Of course, it's much more than that because there is um, because if I speak about signatures, it's only of course the scanning engine, but there is much more than a scanning engine at this moment inside it. it uh, we have much more techniques which are preventing, of course, new kind of uh, malware threats, even hacks, because actually hackers are exactly using the same. Uh, things as what we see malware is using. So um, actually, so we have some kind of mechanisms inside products which are actually also defending you against the hackers and of course against new kind of malware, which is not detected yet by our signatures, for instance. Right. So, okay, so that's a bit of the role of, of what the, of the security industry and, and in the case of the uh, anti-malware companies, but definitely, I think, also to, from the wider perspective, uh, the firewall vendors and, and, and others. Definitely. So, um, Martin, why can't we build in those defense mechanisms um, immediately in the products? No, I think uh, there are products that do have fire scanners in there, for sure. I mean, uh, we are already doing that. I mean, it's quite normal. But I, th I think one of the things you should realize also, eh, for example, if you take something like a virus scanner uh, or you build so something in, that's typically a component that Philips then gets from a virus scanner vendor and doesn't, and then it gets updated. So now suddenly the Philips product will be reliable on also the perimeter security of, the, of, the of that vendor. If that vendor is somehow compromised and sends out a malicious update, then suddenly also the Philips product is compromised. Uh, so the Petya attack was an attack that, as far as I understood, came in through the update mechanism not of one of the suppliers. That's not Patia. Not yeah. Patia, yeah. Yep. Right. And uh, <coughs> so when we discussed that in Philips, and, and uh, we have these daily thread things where these things are coming in, and say, whoa, how many vendors do we uh, rely on? Yeah, if you just look at the the, the, the vulnerabilities that we have from all these vendors, that's huge. So the supply chain dependency through these automated updates is quite large. So on the one hand, let's say security industry can offer solutions. On the other hand, these solutions, again, are not for free. So, but f for sure we do uh, build in such type of uh, scanners, yeah. So, so what should then be the role for, for you as, as um as a manufacturer, as a designer of, of uh, systems, healthcare systems in this case, something that's very um, uh, relevant to all of us. Uh, if we want, once belong into, get into a hospital, then we would like to make sure, of course, that uh, those systems that the doctors are going to use are uh, reliable and secure. Yeah, yeah exactly. So I think uh, yeah, security is, is, is front and center uh, to connected healthcare. I mean, it's one of the things we need to get right. So there's a lot of attention to that in Philips, to, uh, to work on that in all its aspects. So yeah, that's just the thing we need to do. So, so, as, as, um, as a, so in this case, as a device manufacturer, are there steps that, that, you, that you're taking to, um, uh, or what do you see the role of, of, this, of the, the manufacturers um, in, into securing products? Um, yeah, that, 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 that's evolving, and I think there, there, there's, there's a lot of things are being happening in Philips. Eh? So the first thing is we have, of course, a population of developers that develop the, uh, our products, and when a new developer comes into Philips, he gets an additional education in security. Yeah, we, we organize that ourselves, so, so we don't rely on what they learned outside, but we give an additional education there. So that, that's why it starts. Then we have... Uh, product design processes that where they apply what they call security by design uh, techniques. So also in these processes, there are certain steps that they need to take into account such that they get to secure products. Once the products are finished, we have the so-called security center of excellence or the security ninjas, and they test every <laughs> product. So we do an in-house pen test for every product before 
it goes out of the door. That's just a development, right? After it goes out of the door, the story continues. So products in Philips do not go to the market without a full life cycle plan. What are you going to do? Nightmare for all these people that used to have fire and forget. I think that's important to realize that the business model of a company like Philips, especially for the consumer products, usually, I mean, you put your box in media mark, you, for, uh, you sell it and you never have to think about it again. Hopefully they, the, the product works. But now, if it's connected, you actually, you keep a relation with that customer, which on the one hand is nice, on the other hand, maintaining the relation from your side costs money. Mm -hmm. So you need that bu to build that into your plan for releasing that product to market. Now and then of course you need patching, this and that, you need to make sure that you stay up to date with all the surprises that we get uh, from the world and, and react to that appropriately. Can I just, because it's amazing that Philips does this, but what we see is that a lot of companies do not have security uh, as a priority, not even as like a, a final afterthought. A lot of them, because it's also not requested by the customer. The customer doesn't ask how secure is my connected toaster. No, it wants to know how fast can it burn my toaster, not burn it at all. And what we've seen is that, especially from China and non-European countries, uh, the standards are just, it's the cheapest. Um, and I say this not as a, you know, European uh, products are better, but the, the standards you're are... You're not sponsored by Philips tonight, are you? Also. Yeah. <laughs> but what we saw with, um, uh, was it last year, the Mirai botnet attack? So it was the, the heaviest um, DDoS attack that ever happened. You know what a DDoS attack is? It's when a website gets um, so many requests that it just completely um, is no longer available. And so this, this botnet attack was all um, coming from connected cameras, uh, Chinese cameras to be specific. And these were all infected because they didn't even have the possibility to change the password. Now there's crawlers, like Eddie said, uh, that just also go around the web looking for devices to infect, not just looking for infections, looking for devices to infect. There's even a Google called Shodan and it just finds devices with open ports and they've seen that uh, um, they put uh, some researchers put some online, and within 15 seconds they were infected. And these kind of devices, um, it doesn't matter for you as a customer that your security camera is infected. Maybe like maybe you don't mm. care. Maybe it's your toaster or your fridge, and it doesn't really matter. But it can again be a vector to your home network, or it can be used for its computing power. It can yeah, we've, we've seen it a couple of times yeah. on, on the news even uh, over the last couple of months. You have a question over there, but, but Simon, you wanted also to... Uh, yes, yeah, so, so just one remark of following what, what Martin said. So the business model of many consumer electronics companies is indeed fire and forget. You build the product, you ship it, so that's a process that takes yeah, roughly a year. Uh, and then the team that built the product is on to a next product. And there is maybe some what we call sustaining engineering in the industry. And that's about it. But that's more because in case there's an exploding battery. <laughs> but that's not because there's new software. And the, the, the biggest issue, actually, is not to protect against what is known, but to pr protect what is unknown. There are hidden, potentially hidden, flaws in these products and the components you buy that all of a sudden become known and then your product may be vulnerable doesn't mean it is susceptible because then someone needs to start to exploit it so it is also a tough challenge to assess i now have this product i know it's vulnerable but can it actually be used and will it be misused so it takes quite a lot of additional organizational effort and the cost while well actually you already had the revenue in your books and actually want no more cost on that product. So this is why it is uh, much easier for telecom operators to do this because they have the recurring revenue of your subscription. And while it's quite difficult, especially for the manufacturer in China who just has sent a batch to this nice company who, who gets it shipping in, in the a port of Antwerp yeah. and then starts to distribute it on the internet. So here is your nice offer of a webcam. By the way, it's only on sale for one week. Mm -hmm. that, that's that's the uh, yeah. part of the issue. Yeah, and, and reputation and is the only yeah. incentive. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it's not, it's, 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 it's not only China or whatever. Um, <laughs> of <laughs> course, of course uh, not. So, so it's everything actually, because I, 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 I investigated my smart house, 
well, I call it a smart house because I have a lot of devices. You know that. I don't yeah. want to say anything. Yeah, <laughs> anyway, so I have a lot of devices in my home. And actually, you know, I, I took 20 out of the 80 devices. I have yeah, way too much. Um, so, and I was just trying to test and to find out 20 devices. Huh? So that means like an Xbox, uh, you know, a, a PC is also one device. But it could be a router, it could be, uh, you know, these, uh, it could be a smartwatch like this. Um, so I took all those devices, including my smart oven, and uh, I tried to find on the internet in one hour to find a vulnerability, something yep. like a problem related to one of those devices. Out of those 20 devices, I found 17 devices vulnerable. <laughs> so, you know, this is, and this is in one hour. Okay, I I'm an expert, so I can find and I know where to go to. <laughs> of course, there were patches for lots of the, lot of the devices. So I was tracking and trying to find out if the patches were on the systems. <coughs> well, I can tell you that in 15 uh, of the 17 devices, there were no patches on the systems. And that's the other problem, to get the patches on the system. Yeah, but th there's another problem. I mean, <laughs> you are an expert. You I actually know. You <laughs> looked for those devices. I know. How I many consumers will? I know. And, and I, think I know, and that's, as you see. <laughs> I, I think one of the things, if you look about patch management, it's actually a very interesting topic for another evening, but <laughs> there will always be a set of consumers that bought the cheap devices because, you yeah. know, they are not that rich and mm -hmm. whatever, mm -hmm. and they will never patch them. Oh no. Yeah. And frankly, you cannot solve that issue in the device. You need oh. to solve that from the network. Well, you need to quarantine these things. Let's ask Simon, because I mean, what's yeah. the role of the customer here in this case? Y you're running many of those devices with customers, so how do you deal with those things? Good question. So what we do is, um, well, we are in a way uh, lucky, again, because people need to once in a while download a new map. That's not something we do over wireless internet. It's uh, three, four gigabyte. It would cost you too much. So people are attached to their device either through Wi-Fi or to their PC. So while the map is downloaded, we also update the latest security <coughs> updates and, by the way, maybe some new features to the product. And that's because there's also, and we've built this into the, the revenue model we have as well. So that's how we've done it. Uh, uh, well actually, we've done that for, from right from the start. So, because there is a mechanism, we piggyback on it. So that's right. that's the way to to do it. So you so have a product that actually is incentivized because people also always uh, uh, want to have the latest. Maps. Exactly, and 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 we you can subscribe to a notification that there is a new map, and uh, and basically, if you want to have the, the the latest software, yeah, you also get the latest security updates. It's not right. like that's voluntary. Sorry. That's smart. Yeah, and uh, uh, so we, have, we, we also uh, sell sports watches. This is why we do the same. So yeah. if we have a security vulnerability, either we detect it ourselves or people report it to us, which is very helpful as well, uh, uh, then, um, yeah, we can push that out, basically, right. globally. So yeah. the, the, for instance, in, in your case, then, Eddie, the oven, uh, you get a new recipe for your oven yeah. that's connected there. Exactly. So, <laughs> and basically the manufacturer sells it to you, here's a, a set of new recipes for your oven, and at the same time you get the security of that. <laughs> well, that's how, how you think it should go. No, no, no. No, it doesn't go like that. But anyway, uh, of course, the, the problem is indeed related to the patches. And, if, and look at what you have in your... Well, I, I can tell you, I, was, you know? I was recently at an... Uh, a large event from um, Europol, yeah. uh, so you know the European uh, police uh, organization, and the room was full of people, cybersecurity specialists, uh, police, uh, law enforcement uh, people, and we had the same issue on how many IoT devices, of course, 75% uh, of the room um, had IoT devices at their homes, how many of them have recently done an update, uh, probably one third. Exactly. How many have ever done an update? Uh, maybe one tenth. Um, so I, basically, I the, the whole um, even within the industry, we're I not applying this. I think it's it's also part of security by design, and I think those two companies are actually, in my 
uh, well, the good guys <laughs> over here because they do their job quite well, in my opinion. But it's indeed true that a lot of other companies which are not that involved in, in, in IoT or whatever, they don't have that security by design. They just think, okay, we sell it, uh, maybe the cheapest price or whatever, you know, and don't have those security in their mindset yet. And then they start to think about uh, the security. They, they even sell the stuff with but an administration passwords and like that. You know, but, but sometimes but we also have to realize that yeah. to be for, the, for this vulnerability to actually be uh, misused, the device needs to be accessible from the internet. So in many cases, devices aren't, and, but th this is why this, this uh, surveillance camera, or this, no, it was not, well, this camera was such an issue, because you could open it up to the internet, because of course you will want to look to the images when you're not at home. So I personally would not be too worried about my oven, unless I open it up to the internet, because I want to switch it on when I'm driving home. Yes, <laughs> but yeah, but a lot of people are thinking in that way. Hold on, I give, yeah, I yeah, give, okay, I give, yeah. an, I give another example. What about the smart kettle? You know, you have a kettle, a, a water kettle, yeah. yeah, and that water kettle is Ma actually. Martin is sitting there thinking, oh, these. <laughs> no, I'm going to write it all down. Yeah, 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 but yeah, yeah. you have a water kettle. I, I don't know why no, I no, want to have such a thing, but let's let. So it's a for it's sake of it's argument. A, it's <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's a it's a, 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 a water cooking yeah. kettle, you know. Anyway, now this kettle is connected to you know the network. Now you think you're using it, for instance, in in in, uh, in the office. Now you think, what are you going to do with that? You know, why put a kettle, you know, on 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 the internet? Well, actually, it's quite easy. If you start driving from your home and then you are arriving more or less in, in 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 at the company, and you open the doors at that moment, automatically the Internet of Things will say, oh, he's in the environment because everybody has his location switched on on his smartphone, unfortunately. Anyway, though the kettle knows, ah, he's just outside of the company, I'm switching myself on. Nice. Now you think, what is going wrong with that? Nothing. Except the guy who is using the kettle is going with that kettle back to his home. And he's putting the kettle also on his home network. Why? Because he's actually using the same thing on Saturday and Sunday. Yeah, well, he's because he loves coffee, he loves tea. Now you think, what is wrong with that? Well, the thing is, inside a company, we have very good protection. There is no problem at all. Because it's not, you know, you know. Anyway, it's connected to the internet, but it's also connected to the internet in your home network. Now, if some hacker can hack your home network, which is actually quite easy to do, then he can also have a look at the kettle. Now, the problem is that the credentials of the network of the company is also in the kettle. That's where the hacker is going for. It's not to burn up or to heat up the kettle, like everybody thinks. It's because of the password which is inside the kettle of the company. So let's now refrain from the kettle concept <laughs> and put in place a smartphone. <laughs> yes. And you have exactly the same thing. Yes. Right. Yeah, I think as a matter of statistics, there will always be a, 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 a category of products that were sold with some flaws, whether by being cheap or whether they bought stupid Intel chips. I mean, it, there will always be a category that at a certain point in time is vulnerable, and if it's connected to the internet, it takes a couple of minutes. Yeah, it's risk management. And uh, uh, when when the <laughs> the hard bleed attack was published, a university that knew it was what happening tested from the publication of the attack. Then they still have to program the malware, right? To when the attack started, there was 24 hours at that time. So there will always be a, a, a category of products that will be compromised. And the first thing that the hacker does, if he's any good, he will disable the update mechanism. <laughs> so now what? Vendor right. has no more control. We had a comment from over there. I can yes, um, yes, perhaps I have a, a real question, but uh, I also would uh, like to uh, give a comment so far. Uh, but it's my personal opinion, and I'm not a specialist. I have been out of this domain for 
for two years now. I do think that the Internet of Things is actually a big hype. I, and, and why is that? Because uh, one of the panel actually indicated it. You have to decide first what kind of appliances are useful to have online. Why would you have your coffee maker or your water cooker or your fridge or your oven mm -hmm. or your television? Why have it online? Now, for the television, we immediately know, yes, that would be a good idea. But for a lot of other stuff, you don't want that. Yes. So there is this careful choice. I mean, one of you said it, this careful choice to make uh, for your own security, whether it's worthwhile to go high tech and why not stay low tech? For example, in the kitchen, I only use Right. A few knives, yeah, well. not linked to the internet, that's, that's and I never yeah, will excellent. link them. Yeah. So that's my comment. Every once in a while, you also need a fork, but uh, yeah. Yeah. So the, knives, the knives are a good, good thing to have. Kitchen knives, right. kitchen yeah. knives. I mean, no, so uh, th that's a general remark. Uh, I would no, like no, it's, you it's, to. It's a, fair, it's a fair point. The Internet of Thing, of course, is a bit of a buzzword. I, I rather call it things on the internet. But the fact is that a lot of these things. Uh, all of a sudden happen to have mm. a network connection, mm. Wi-Fi, because it's so yeah. cheap to do. A and printer? there always is some sort of a nice <laughs> feature that you could also use remotely. So there's a lot of new devices coming online, but it's also not necessarily... Uh, well, the, the kettle example, uh, there's not met many people that, that will have uh, uh, that, that, that kind of... Uh, Can you give me a few uh, examples because I'm so uh, the, quite ignorant? The, ignorant. The, no, the smart thermostat. That's something uh, that, that is taking on. So the what? The smart thermostat. The smart thermostat. Yeah, yeah so that's typically uh, um, having uh, a, a big hard disk in your home. That's also yeah. a part of it. Yeah, so yeah. And, and yeah. very interesting to, to yeah. hack into. Yeah, the, the so dash, do you know the Dash button? So the, the brand Dash, no. as in was Twitter than Bit? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Dash, a button. That button is connected to the internet because you put it on your fridge, it has a magnet, you press it, and by pressing it, it sends a signal to another device which says, next time that you go shopping, there's an alert going off in your, in your pocket because your cell phone reminds you, I need Dash. <laughs> so, so there's people that have uh, internet connected scales to weigh themselves so they can track that. I have that in my I have that in my bathroom actually. Yeah, so that that's, ah. that's that's an example. Uh, a white things, a white things uh, scale that is linked to my iPhone. Yes, and your iPhone is linked to the internet. So it may not necessarily really? go to your fixed connection. So yeah. another example is vehicles. Many vehicles these days have an embedded connection. Who who so of you in the audience have a have a smartwatch? Okay, so you yourself, uh, actually. Mm -hmm. So your smartwatch, it's monitoring you constantly, it's monitoring your heartbeat, it's trying to support you in your health system, um, uh, telling you how many steps have you been walking today. Always not enough, we know that. <laughs> um, so it's trying to give you some ideas of what to do better and, and improve your health. But that watch is connected to your phone, it sends the data to somewhere of the internet. You don't control what's being sent. You don't control who controls this data. And so you're basically a bit of an uh, lost there as well in, in all of your mm. personal data that, uh, that has come. Actually, I, 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 I'm not entirely in agreement with that. Excellent. Because, because uh, uh, if, if you talk smartwatches, um, a lot of that information is available. And actually, also the privacy authorities have been kicking in quite strongly on a few of those manufacturers because uh, especially smartwatches, but also sports watches, carry uh, fitness-related data, yes. mm -hmm. which is fairly sensitive, because you can derive all kinds of conclusions from that, so that needs to have proper protection. And, uh, and it's kind of now a day, it's kind of a watershed there. <laughs> if you have uh, ra rather normal brands like Garmin, TomTom, Tom, uh, uh, Polar, Fitbit, it's pretty okay. But of course, there's the Chinese import thing. Mm. That's not so okay. There is, for instance, a... Again. Uh, yeah, so here in Belgium, we also have HEMA. Uh, uh, we have them in, in the Netherlands, they're in the UK. They used to have this uh, Chinese import. And, um, well, there was the Dutch Data Protection Authority that gave them a phone call. Are you aware your data, the data is m moving to China? I don't think that's okay. So they immediately stopped selling it. So right. things happen it's there. Right. So there's also there's also other ways to protect the security uh, there. But th that was next to the, the the comment. There was also a question. 
Yeah. And thank you very much for your comments because it proves that even I myself am not aware of how many of the devices I use and I have are really connected. Mm -hmm. And that's the point that uh, Natalie uh, yeah. po the, the made that actually it's about an education gap that we are not aware of the risks we have and risks that are related to our, um, our behavior. But, uh, so thank you very much for enlightening me. But my question is the following. So recently I have this, um, with the New Year's resolutions, I thought I'm gonna start a diary and uh, I smoke too many cigars, so I'm gonna watch my expenses. Mm -hmm. And I found on the internet uh, a, a very nice uh, application uh, to, to do a journal, a journal and it even reminds you, uh, you should start your day by doing your journal. And I have this wonderful um, application where um, when I, I went uh, buying a bread, it tells me exactly where I am, the shop. I can click whether it is my favorite or not. I put in the price of the, broth, of the bread, make a picture of the receipt, and so on. So these two apps I have, and now I'm wondering about security. Uh, because, of course, security is only a priority for the security com industry and for those companies that have a reputation to defend of building serious stuff. For the rest, we are at risk. So my question to you is, could you comment on that? What would you recommend? Should I use my pencil and my paper for my journal? <laughs> or, and should I use the nail in the kitchen to put the receipts on? Or would you uh, advise me to go uh, 21st century and say, hey, you have an iPhone, please use these two apps because yeah. you should look cool. Well, no, no, it's, it's actually it's easy, the answer for that. Actually, the answer is easy, so you should go for it. However, <laughs> um, because you were also the only one who was not putting up his hand when I asked who is having an antivirus scanner, and you were one of the only ones not putting yeah, your hand up. Because I have an Apple computer. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Oh my God, okay. <laughs> but so you, you, you may be infecting others. Yeah, exactly. He, he is not aware of actually that he's, oh. he's maybe already infected for five years now. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. So, but, but anyway, so what you do need is actually, you need, you, you need security products. Because the security products are helping you, that's one thing. So, they are going to try to close the gap, actually. The gap of the other vendors, which are not, you know, well, can't do it all the time. So, that, that's one thing, because that's what actually a security vendor is doing. Um, and secondly, you have to be careful where you are, you know, using the app from. If you're downloading it, and if you're using an iPhone, you're of course less risky. Um, but if you're using Android, for instance, well, we have more than at this moment. Oh yes, by the way, concerning numbers, if you have uh, Android, we have more than f 17 million Android um, uh, malicious apps. So then you have to be careful where you download the app from. It's simply said, everything but Apple is Android. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, um, so then you have to be careful with that. But even downloading it from the place, from the, from the, the Google Play Store, of course, is even risky because it also contains sometimes also malicious apps. So you always have to be careful with that. But anyway, if you're downloading something, the only indication you, you can have is that we can, of course, prevent it. And, and, and that's so, it. So I guess in your yeah. case, because you're an, an, an Apple user, you're having an iPhone. So okay, it looks like an iPhone yeah. from, from okay. the very far distance where I'm sitting. That doesn't mean that there are no problems with it, actually. But it's, it's a good sign, because your Apple phone will be a bit better protected. Yeah. Yeah. Anyways, I think yeah. uh, Simon, so, yes. so, But actually, your question is, how can I trust these two apps? That's, that's the key question. Yeah. Well, the uh, malware attaches itself sometimes not to the, uh, let's say, the hardware, but goes to a weak link in the application. It depends. Application. Could, could be. But, but let's go one step back without the, the discussion related to malware. The first thing uh, is, 
you are putting a lot of your data in that app. So how can you make sure that that data remains yours and isn't used for reasons or purposes you of are course. either not aware or do not approve, let, us, let alone purposes that you wouldn't approve and yeah, so because there's malicious software in there. So one That's of the things both Apple and uh, uh, Google these days do is that they oblige, aside from the fact that there's law that obliges the app vendor to tell you what data it will use, why it will be using it, and where it will be sending it. That should be in a little explanation, like a medicine edition, so it's called the privacy statement, which explains that to you. The fact that it's not there is already a signal, maybe something iffy is happening. So, the first check is, is it there at all? You can read that. As part of that, because this is data from you, there is law that basically says it needs to be protected looking at the relevance of the data, so what could be the risks to you, uh, and what is technically these days the state of the art. It doesn't have to be the state of the art, but it needs to take into consideration the state of the art. State of the art is moving. They are moving the state of the art. So, that's a, so it's an improving uh, thing. And the cost. Because the question also is, did you pay for this app? So if you pay, <laughs> you're probably not the product. Exactly. If it's free, you always need to additionally read what's in this privacy statement because it may very well be that this app vendor actually <coughs> wants to have an overview of bread prices around you. And you could be totally fine to be the scout for bread prices for this app vendor because it delivers you a service, that's fine. But now, you, what you would do, wouldn't want is your insurance company, your health insurance company, to know that the, the bread you're eating is white bread rather than nice loaf. They might want to, so this is, and then we have the malware thing. So this is the privacy versus security demonstrated yep. according to an app. It starts with, have you paid for the app or not? Can you read the privacy statement and make sure you download it from the app stores? <coughs> Don't download it from somewhere else because then the probability of it having, let's say, uh, cheatware embedded, malware, whatever, okay, is can, can I can I, uh, can I add a little bit to it because your app sounds to me like kind of a niche app, I mean you paid for it, so often these companies that make such apps, they actually don't make money. They are hopeful people that are disappointed in the app store, they go bankrupt, yep. and you know when the strangest things happen in a company, hmm. when they're distressed, when they have no more money, they can't pay their bills, and they feel shit, and uh, they don't care, and then basically what you do then, you, you do a fire sale, right? Who wants to buy my stuff? I, oh, you want to buy my app? Here you go. And we have seen that, that malicious actors have actually bought such uh, plugins, for example, for browsers, and then did an update, right? And then, of course, introduced malware, or in your case, bought the company, then got all the data, and they don't read the privacy statement anymore, because, you know, so when you trust Basically, you trust uh, a company with your data and you allow them to run on your meltdown vulnerable device their software, you, you, you enter a trust relationship. So do you trust that company you got the app from? You and do. No. Yeah, there is, a, there <laughs> is no, another no, thing. Uh, your, uh, no, no, but, but <laughs> on the other hand, how, <laughs> no, but, but how bad it is, is it if your bread price is... Uh, yeah, uh, my yeah? Fitness app, my fitness app. yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did, did you ever read the end user license agreement? <laughs> never, never. <laughs> well, that, that is the problem. If I read it, I actually I wouldn't install any app anymore. <laughs> so, so let's let's maybe take it a step further. Maybe there's there's a solution from governments that might be putting out some some regulation, some law that might help us here. Well, I mean, most of you have heard of the GDPR, the General Data Protection yeah. Regulation, and this actually, you've, you've already reached some points uh, of what the GDPR does, but one of them is also, if your company would go bankrupt and it would sell its stuff, I think it would also be obligated to tell its users and to give their users the possibility to own their data and to put it either in their own possession or at a different uh, supplier. 
Um, and so this is coming into effect in May. And so if in May you notice that uh, your app is being sold, you can actually, if they don't warn you, you can sue them. Yeah, even, even with GDPR, you can ask what they have. And so they're obligated to Yeah, tell you. because they're obligated also to show what they have from you. So that's one of the positive side effects of, well, actually it is the effect of <laughs> GDPR, actually. Uh, so the transparency with uh, personal data is very good. Getting, getting back to your question with me, uh, uh, what's also happening is that um, there's other uh, 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 regulations put in place. So one of them is, uh, is what's called the NIST Directive, Network and Information Systems, which currently applies to what is called critical infrastructures. Now, typically, a critical infrastructure is the telecommunications sector, the energy sector. So a few key, uh, so th and this law, so it starts from where the where the biggest risks are. So when there really is an issue in society when something happens there. This will trickle down over time. So currently what's also being debated is to come up with either soft law as it's called or actual regulation related to uh, uh, th these devices. Because the question of course is who is liable? Because, well you talked about the entire uh, uh, chain of, of well component manufacturing and so on. So that's that's a tough subject. But the good news actually is we already have a model. There is a model. Um, uh, I, I touched upon exploding batteries. Well, there is a regulation which uh, is the so there's two. There's there's all kinds of consumer protection and the so-called radio equipment directive, which basically says you can sell equipment, but you need to certify that a certain set of safety-related uh, things are not uh, violated. <coughs> so, and, and you have this, you probably have seen it, this CE mark. So this mark, in essentially says, this provider has stated what it does, it's been independently verified, and if it breaks that, that is actually an economic offense. Now, you can find toys with these things, but you can also find it on any of the device you have. Unfortunately, Currently, that does not cover information security or cybersecurity, but it does cover safety. So it actually, for a regulator, would be a fairly easy step to basically say it should not only cover uh, safety, things like food safety, physical batteries, safety, physical safety, it should also cover cybersecurity, information security, according to these and these rules, and by the way, if GDPR is violated, we consider that to be part of this as well. Because then basically what you do is you transpose the, the, the stuff that's already there into those products. So I would not be against that. And something to add to that, um, the whole scale of the law protecting us, um, we see it in the, in the industry, but we also see it in the, the state conflict uh, matter where almost every country is recognized international law is applicable to cyber activity. Yeah. So if a cyber attack would be launched and would have certain damage that would be equatable to, uh, yeah. for example, safety um, consequences, it's still applicable. And this is something that we're struggling with. Uh, is the digital a new domain? Do we need to make new laws for it? Can we apply the existing laws to digital? And, and actually, if you look into it, there's, there's in many cases surprisingly a lot of hooks that you can add stuff to, which it has an advantage because you can piggyback on existing processes been in within businesses that need to do this stuff anyway, but you can also piggyback on existing enforcement because there is no point in putting in place laws and regulation if you do not have proper enforcement. And now the interesting thing about Internet of Things enforcement is that these goods are shippable they arrive on boats and in airplanes at well-known entry points in Europe, which typically are Antwerp and Brussels, uh, Antwerp and Rotterdam. Can I, can I, I inter say. interrupt yeah. for one Just moment? Just leave it to Antwerp and Brussels. Because yeah. uh, we, we, we <laughs> were discussing indeed on, on, okay, could we do some CE or some yeah. kind of regulations on, on, on uh, internet-connected products? And then I asked the question, uh, apps, do you consider them products? And the answer was, yeah, of course. So they're not always shippable. I mean, um, and they're the exactly the same vulnerabilities that apply to uh, to uh, 
to an Internet of Things product with a dedicated function hardware no, around no, it. No, but uh, I'm, not, I'm, I'm just trying to put in place some elements. I'm not trying to boil the ocean here. Anything that you can add can help. So let's not drive for perfection. Let's drive at step by step. So if we can cover IoT, so the imports from China, these, these devices, which I think we can, then we've already taken away something. On apps, apps get downloaded through the app stores. So mm, maybe we should incentivize those who sell those apps to make sure that they're sufficiently okay. Well, actually, Google and Apple is doing that more or less. But, <laughs> but the uh, last time that I checked, both of them were American companies. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But the yeah. whole classification of what is an app, yeah. I mean, we've seen this with Uber as well. Yeah. Uber was uh, really holding on to, no, we're an information, uh, what, what was it again, a community app? Mm -hmm. Well, they're a transportation app, they're a yeah. yeah. taxi service. And the same with Airbnb, uh, yeah. It's they really have been trying to hide behind we're an app, while I think again, not to tout the horn of, of Europe, but it's good that the EU has said, stop, what you are doing is classified under certain rules and regulations. And, and it took us only three years to <laughs> arrive there. <laughs> and that is very, very, very quick. <coughs> yeah, I'm not pessimistic about this, <laughs> really. So, In so the grander scheme of things, three years is very short, mm. really. M Martin, you, you have a sort of a viewpoint on, on the CE mark your well, uh, so, so what I I think it's a very complicated subject. I understand that we want to set some rules and regulations on cybersecurity because mm. it could be helpful. And certainly, what we don't want is that every country starts to reinvent the wheel. And now we we want to harmonize that because otherwise, developing for every country alone becomes a nightmare. But I want to warn people against saying, "Oh, we will quickly do this." It's like safety. It's like uh, it's not the same. We are talking here about uh, something that's very quickly evolving. Yeah, so it's a moving target, which yes. in safety is definitely, I mean, the, if you understand the physics, you understand the physics. Cybersecurity, you think you understand it, and then, hey, the, the, the game changes again. And also, you have a malicious opponent. And I think that's an essential thing that I want to really bring across. If you make regulations, for example, you talked about liability. Shall we make everybody liable? If, if you make a company liable for the actions of what somebody else is going to do maliciously, he actually, you gave him an extra weapon to hurt you. It's, it's interesting because we've already done, done that with the GDPR. Because so I become now, as when I have data, liable when someone breaks into my digital house. You know, if, if a burglar breaks into your house, you're a victim. I think you're only liable if you don't react. No, to no, no, but no, no, but essentially, so no, no, I have to defend that I put the right locks on my, uh, on my uh, data center, so to speak. So I'm not, I'm not saying against that, so, but my point is, it is not already unheard of, and we need to start moving into that direction. I totally appreciate the situation is different, the <laughs> dynamics are different, uh, and, and maybe there are no easy solutions, but we can't wait for solutions. I still think there, there you know, it, it starts actually with um, stating, uh, as a producer of, of uh, equipment, what you will do. So that's basically your li the life cycle plan you refer to, to the essential elements to put that onto the package. So this product, you will not get security updates. This product, you will get three years worth of security updates. Yeah. Best before. Exactly. So, so and, and, and then competition will kick in as well. But, but at least you, and then the question is, what happens to you as a buyer of such a product when it gets misused? Is but, it, is but it but the um, user then? But not only that, um, I think also as the end users, um, you're saying, okay, we produce some patches as we call them, so updates to make sure that there's the insecurities are being removed. But as Adi was saying, um, we need to do that for all of our devices. What if we don't do that? What if we are not following those rules? So is Natalie, is there some expectation also from the end user maybe that we need to have? Uh, so in trying to resolve this challenge of uh, cybersecurity. So we, we talked about the security industry, there's a bit of government, there's a bit of the industry that takes responsibility. <coughs> what about the end users? Well, um, 
I think we're all in agreement here that we need to tackle cybersecurity from every possible angle. We need to stop criminals as well. This isn't just about making our appliances safe or making our end users aware that there's a problem. We also <coughs> need to stop the people committing it. Luckily, we don't have any criminals on the panel. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, as, as an end uh, user... You sure? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but anyway, we, but this is something we also do, uh, by the way. We, we, we help police forces with that. <laughs> So this is something you maybe not know that uh, the security industry is doing that a lot. But, but you know, there are two models here with patches, right? One is I make the patch available and the user, he installs it. Yep. You can also go for the model, I, I will just install the patch. I mean, I don't ask the yeah, user but because but I don't... The, I, it's probably for some products, they are so Internet of Thingsy, they have no user interface. You can't even tell the user that there's a patch, so I'll just do it automatically. One of the things that I personally am a little bit offended with often is, um, is, is with my iPhone. It's a good example. I bought this nice iPhone and it has this beautiful user interface and then I download my security patch and suddenly it has a shitty user interface with Joni Ives New Age colors. That happened to me, right? <laughs> and I didn't want that. I never asked. I bought the other one and, I, and now I have this one. <laughs> And, and the only way to keep the other one was to never get security patches again. And so there's this tie-in between that a vendor after the fact changes the functionality of my device. I mean, Apple made things slower. And so you see that happens a lot. And but that, that was what and, Simon and, was referring and that to makes earlier. It, yeah. you, got then you got the new service. You got the new, a new edge. Yeah, but then interface. I can understand that. I, I mean, if they're going to push that automatically to me, is it every morning I wake up and I'm wondering how my phone looks today. <laughs> but this well, is also a problem that, I mean, we talked about the privacy security conflicts, but there's also a security freedom conflict. The user wants to do whatever the user wants to do. And if the user wants to be vulnerable, if the user doesn't want to choose super difficult passwords, use the same password for every possible device, the user wants to do that. And here's the question how much this can be imposed especially because it's not just about the user's own safety, it's about everyone's safety. You know, the, the concept in virology, we talk about uh, herd immunity. So it's if as many possible people protect themselves, the herd as itself is also more protected. So that the people who can't protect themselves, uh, or the ones, companies yeah. who have like slow password updates, etc. This, this is why uh, vaccination of children is obligatory. Exactly. So if, you, if we drop below a 95% mm -hmm. rate, yeah, so that's, that's yeah. and uh, but, but, but that's not to be taken lightly because intruding into those kinds of freedom is, yeah, so... It and the problem is that for now, the user, I mean, sorry if I talk to you about, about you as users, but uh, it's, people are still not aware enough it's of the security problem. Users, yeah. Yeah. People, the, the users. population is not aware of the security problem, so they're not ready to give up that freedom. They're not ready to say like, okay, let's do it for the greater good. Yep, I'll remember 20 different passwords. But do you start this evening... <laughs> You started this evening by, by saying, I mean, it's a complex thing and, and you need to know about and you try to explain. Mm. Do we really need to know? I mean, do we have to go to some sort of, um, uh, if you go on the internet, you need a driver's license. If, if you, you want to download apps, you need a, an app store driver's license or something of a kind. Is, isn't that maybe something worthwhile considering? I mean, uh, what is a driver's license? It's knowledge, right? Yeah, it's, 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 it's a proof, proof of, of your knowledge. And so of some capabilities to be able to drive in, in the rear into a parking lot, yeah. where some people still have some difficulties. But, still, never but yeah, so it's if we can solve things with techn technological solution, if we can make the systems more secure, sure. Like if we can make the users be as, as comfortable as they, they want and have the freedom to do whatever they want, even better. But the human will mostly, most of the time, be the way for a hacker to get in. Okay. Through a phishing mail, through uh, unsecure mm -hmm. passwords. Through yeah, can I get it? So I, I, I yeah. agree we need to definitely raise the education level, but let's also be realistic, 20 is never going to happen. <laughs> Not but for me at least. But that's why we can recommend uh, password managers uh, as well. But, uh, and I think, let's face it, we still have computers where a, a user, by moving his mouse and Pressing a button can compromise the system. That is really yeah. Stone Age technology in yeah. my book. But that is that is a very low. Well, that's I mean a very high bar you give to the users. The but NHS had Windows XP when WannaCry hit. Mm. So I mean. Yeah, but but I so I think there's still a lot to do there in just making. Th there was a, a gentleman over there with a question, and, and if anybody else still has a question or a comment, please uh, please also gentleman over there.
It's on. It was on. <laughs> now it's on. Uh, I would like to ask uh, your uh, opinion on, uh, for me, one of the most common security uh, issues is the password handling. I mean, uh, we all owe, we all have uh, dozens of passwords, but most people, especially the common users, do not they really take care of them. Uh, in the last 15, 20 years, we have managed to build in Wi-Fi and other hardware that was very expensive 15 or 20 years ago in almost everything. But we aren't uh, uh, trying to push hard for uh, two-factor authentication, something that you know and something that you have. Why there is no second factor, uh, sorry, uh, two-factor authentication, like for example, uh, uh, fingerprinting or, or fingerprint uh, readers or something like that. I have seen in some tablets, in some, uh, iPhones and I think in some uh, Android devices, but only in, in a few of them. And password handling for me is one of the biggest issues that is, is maybe not as relevant as this meltdown on this uh, Mirai botnet, but it's <coughs> so common and so often that I don't know why do you think that it's not uh, this kind of, of uh, uh, things being uh, pushed so they are widely adopted? Thank you very much. Because it's too difficult. Too Difficult for the user, it seems. Uh, actually, if, if, if I look at it, uh, because you have it for Google, you have it for Facebook, you have it for all, you know, the typical things. Who is using it over here? Two-factor authentication. Well, yeah, you, you, but no, yeah, it's roughly 10%. Yeah, I would yeah, say. Roughly 10. Yeah, but you know, these are people who are interested in the subject. It came out uh, two days ago. 90% uh, of Gmail users do not use two-factor exactly. authentication. Exactly. You see, and and that's what I mean. Uh, you know, even if they try to push it, because sometimes they try to push some of the mechanisms to you, you know, it, it doesn't happen. You actually should all go to the CPDP conference where Google has a booth and they are actually giving away those two factor, the, the second factor. Uh, so go over there and, and ask them for a second factor authentication for your Gmail. If anybody's using Gmail, of course. If, if I may, um, to reply to your question, like why isn't anyone doing anything on this? Um, what do you want us to do? Each of the, the mobile devices. I mean, you, you, there are many, many devices that nobody will buy if there are no Wi-Fi <coughs> connected, for example, or no Bluetooth connected. But they are being massively producing device without, like, say, a fingerprint. If your second factor authentication will be a fingerprint, it will be as easy as to put your finger on your device to authenticate yourself with your password. Well, and if your password is crap, you have your fingerprint. Why is... Mm, well, to why be very honest, um, it's not a safe measure. I mean, it's not a, a safe for everything no. measure. It's not no. like, oh, True. if we only do this, everything's going to be safe. And yeah. also, if the it system helps. isn't implemented well and your fingerprint gets hacked, you're going to need another thumb or something. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. <laughs> well, yeah, there are always possibilities in that way. Yeah. There's a business so of It has, no? I mean, New having, I, I, I know that it's not paradise, but it's better than having one, two, three, four, five. True. Yeah, yeah. And, and, uh, uh, it's definitely we, we, it's definitely better, and it actually I think it is not. I think the problem lays with the the manufacturers, which are not pushing this too much to the to users. In my opinion, they should is do this much but, more. But I think the point yeah. of Natalie is, is, uh, is correct in the sense that it's uh, only one aspect of the whole yeah, uh, yeah, of course. component. Could I mean, it's not going to. If you're able to get in access on your device, it's not going to be. Uh, yeah. The solution for yeah. you clicking on a phishing email yeah. is going to there download is. the next yeah. ransomware. Of course, if malware is on the device, it will right. take over your machine. It will know everything. And it can take over just everything. And right. Mm -hmm. So I think so. here, any other questions uh, or comments uh, from Matt? OK, we have a question over there. And then there's, there's a uh, microphone heading towards you. Um, <laughs> and then I think after that, we're going to quickly wrap up um, some final comments from, from the panel. and then. So it's, it's rather a fun question, but right now we're with the malware and all these things um, and the advances in the automotive industry, um, would you as security experts step into a self-driving car with connection to the internet? Uh, guilty as charged, in the sense that I am driving a self-driving car, an autonomous driving car. So, and, and I feel relatively safe in it. Um, 
relatively. So it's just a feeling. <laughs> because I still have some level of control over what I'm doing and what the car can do uh, for me. So in that sense, um, I think both me and Ari as well, with the 80 devices in his house, um, yeah. and probably some, some others, maybe Simon and Natalie as well, um, Martin, I'm, I'm a bit worried about you in terms of digitization, but anyways, uh, <laughs> no, but <laughs> no, it's, it's, um, I think you have to, um, we try to be uh, advocating what cybersecurity is, but if you're not applying it, if you're not using it yourself and, and experience the challenges related to cybersecurity, um, then you sometimes don't even know what you're talking about. Exactly. And so we do take that level ourselves, go into the testing, go into the, the, uh, the updates, trying to figure out how much data is leaking to really figure out if, if those devices are, are secure. And if we find vulnerabilities, then um, we also have a sort of a responsibility, which is called responsi responsible disclosure. So we then report that to the app maker, to the manufacturer of the device, try to do something against this flaw that we just found. But anyway, I'll um, let the, uh, the rest of the panel also address the same question. Oh. Anybody of you driving a self-driving car? Um, yeah, what's called self-driving cars, so I tend to call automated driving, because the, the moment self-driving cars drive on the canals in Amsterdam, I believe it's self-driving cars, but it will get there. <laughs> but actually, my, my point is a different one. So this is where if security and safety come very close together. Now picture, that uh, there were no cars. And now you were told that we will allow human beings to drive vehicles, to steer, steer yeah. vehicles with brains that were built for 20 kilometers per hour at 120 kilometers per hour. Mm -hmm. Is it safe to have humans drive vehicles or should we, at the moment autonomous vehicles are there, stop giving out driver's licenses? Mm -hmm. That's, that's the question we're heading toward. Yeah. Very quick response to that. Yeah. At the moment, if some, someone has epilepsy, we do not allow them to drive the car. Mm -hmm. Yes. But your software in your car might also have malware. Mm -hmm. so exactly. Yeah. So, no, but so, 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 so this, this is why that? automated yeah. vehicles rely on multiple systems, resilience, robustness. They do not only rely on their sensors, they have a map because then they can look around the corner. There's, there's, and there's a whole industry going on to make sure that it's happened. Because currently, we apply a higher standard to automated vehicles than we apply to the 18-year-old that just got his driver's license <laughs> and stepped into the Ford Capri. And rightly so. Which, which, which is fine that we do that, but we do need to realize that humans are very bad at risk assessment, actually. Yeah. Yeah. But at least they're still humans, and yeah. I think that's... Yeah, that's yeah, yeah, no. yeah. <laughs> Totally agree, totally agree. <laughs> but but, but, no, but you need, to, you need to, 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 to also start thinking in terms of... So I'm not saying we, won't, we should go there, but it's just a thought experiment. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I'm absolutely not worried about one autonomous driving car. But if, let's say, the new Volkswagen range, yeah, the, the 100,000 that were sold, they get Myra botnetted, so the entire range is hacked at the same time. <laughs> And now we have a really smart attacker, not just som somebody who ransomware you and it doesn't drive anymore, but a really smart one that really wants to kill people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And sure. he does that no, on no, the day that the children go back to school. But this is a scenario that has been thought through. So the, yeah. uh. the, the road authorities, <laughs> no, no, the road author the type approval regulators. So this is a totally different system in, in uh, vehicles. There's type approval, and they're currently uh, uh, at the UN level building security requirements for these kinds of cars. And they're very detailed, and it's not a one-off, it's an ongoing thing. So this actually, uh, uh, all of the learnings from what we talked today are applied in this space, and it will be approved. Mm. So, so I'm, not, I'm not saying it's perfect, it, eh? but it is absolutely a different situation. You're hearing it? This is actually a bigger pr issue than an atom bomb, kills more people in a shorter time than an atom bomb over a larger area, and they will make sure they make a damn and secure and system. And, why, and, why, no, but and while we're talking about this, every week the equivalent of a Boeing 747 of people die in traffic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so let's not forget that. And the, the numbers are going up again. So, you know, 
Yeah. Traffic safety is a bigger problem. Yeah, but there is a There's difference. more people dying in traffic uh, than dying yeah, from but malware attacks. But there is a big difference yeah. because, the, because the navigation system of the, f of the airplane is not connected actually to a self-driving system all the time. So, uh, and, and, and that's the big difference. So I would not drive a self-driving car if I don't have a steering wheel. I see cars without steering wheel at this moment. And if I don't have the power to disconnect it completely from uh, the internet or the con connected world, I will not do it. <laughs> you, you know, you're still, it doesn't I, matter I, whether I, you drive I will drive not do it because I, I, I know, because I, I know also that I possibly will be targeted. Y yeah, because but the car next to you is self-driving. Yeah, that's also a problem, sorry I know, I know, I know. But it's not but the case yet, sorry. you know, so uh, that was not his question. Yeah, but who says these cars will be connected to the internet? I want Oh, yeah, that's so an interesting question. Uh, the internet, in my view, is totally unsuited for these kind types of applications. It was never built for that. It yeah, but that's that's what we are. Yeah, that's no, what no, we so are. So no, no, <laughs> no, but reality. No, but who says cars will be connected to the internet? You know, the the the. The intimate de uh, uh, well, uh, data processing going on. Well, even if it's another network, the network can be hacked. So that's always a problem. So it doesn't matter. If, if I may, just as a sort of wrap up. Um, <laughs> yeah, yes. Because uh, you're absolutely right, Martin, that there is danger and should we even do it whatsoever? And I, I completely agree. Like, there's so many other things, uh, other attacks that happen. Humans have their own threat management framework that they work in. And some people, you know, have a risk that is very high, they're like, I know of all the vulnerabilities that I am, um, I know that I could uh, be attacked, I know of the threats that are out there, which are currently not a lot when it comes to self-driving cars or just cars in general. And people take risks based on that. I think the only thing we can do in this situation is make people aware of the threats there are, so the, the odds that they have of actually being attacked, and the vulnerabilities. What could happen if you get attacked? Your car could stop, okay, big deal, or your car could drive itself into the canal, bigger deal. So, and this is, I think, in general, like as my concluding remarks on cybersecurity, um, is that people have their own risk assessment that they make, and we shouldn't stop people from taking those risks because it, it'll inhibit people in using the internet and all its functionalities. But people should be aware of what risks they take and should make a well, you know, decided on decision of what they're doing. Right, and I think basically. The, the final debate here sums it up quite nicely. I mean, there are cyber challenges. They are growing and uh, they will still be there over the next uh, couple of years, even with regulations, even with the industry uh, influences and so forth. So maybe Simon, for you, uh, a one minute wrap up um, from, uh, from your perspective and how, how does the uh, European cyber security challenge look like from your perspective? So it is important to first assess actually the risk and then not get too fussed up about a lot of malware around because the question is are you vulnerable which was demonstrated exactly there I am on OS uh, whatever uh, I'm, I'm not vulnerable could be so it is very easy to make this big but we need to dissect it an elephant you eat in part, parts as we say so that we, and then we can move forward Yes. Never eat elephants. elephants. <laughs> <laughs> right, thanks. You eat an elephant in slices, I think <laughs> it's, it's cold. Yeah. Martin. Well, I, I had a wheel once that <laughs> close that's to an elephant. That's closer it to an elephant. doesn't taste very nice. Um, yeah, for me, I think that uh, the world is going through digital transformation and it brings a lot of advantages. It can actually make us more secure eh, in, many, in many cases. Uh, but let's not forget the real cost, which is we have to work hard on cybersecurity, put more minds on it, more people on it, get better solutions that, that we don't get these huge risks. I don't mind actually that somebody gets killed by a car. It happens. I mean, society will go on. A family will mourn, but you know, there are also knives in my kitchen cupboard and I can stick people with it. Society can handle it. And so can you. <laughs> but I think, I think uh, cyber security, if you don't manage it well, if you don't keep working on it, it spirals out of control. <coughs> it gets to the scale of a Myra uh, attack and that becomes too big. And then we need to act and, and contain the risks and manage it and make it smaller. And I think 
we're going to spend a couple of years managing that until we understand how to deal with this cyberspace. And everybody needs to learn. Eddie. But I think GDPR is a very good start um, because actually it doesn't, it's not only about the transparency of your, you know, your personal data, but it's also about, you know, the uh, security of, of the data itself. Finally, we have something in place where we will be more or less sure that at least there is some security in place to protect our data. So that's one thing. But we should work much more closely together. I see so many, um, how should I tell, um, you know, projects, European-wide, uh, company-based, uh, governmental-wise. My hope really, and, and, and this is a hope I actually am already thinking about this about 20 years now, uh, is that we all work much more closer together. Um, so that means that the security industry uh, is also more working more closely together with governments, with 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 um, you know with companies as well, you know, and 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 also in Europe to to have a better secure uh, Europe in place, in my opinion. Right, <clears throat> and let me add them maybe as a final final comment to this. Um, in cybersecurity, there's also a lot of development going on uh, in the security of it, in that sense. And we're also using the same levels of automation, even self-driving mechanisms, but then for, uh, for security, so where there's a lot of automation and computation being used to really figure out how we can automate, actually, the, uh, the, the challenges and the vulnerabilities. And so I also have high hopes in, in these developments that uh, even through those automated processes, we can actually uh, um, fight some of the battles. So um, let me um, thank, in any case, uh, my panel um, for these interesting comments and uh, contributions uh, so late and in the Wednesday evening. And uh, you, definitely, uh, for your questions and uh, comments and, uh, and staying here with us and participating. So I think um, I would like to welcome you on uh, behalf of uh, the Buren for a, for a drink and maybe some additional uh, discussion and debate. And I uh, hope to see you again, either here uh, or at any of the other activities that uh, uh, any of us might be organizing. Thank you very much. Thank you, gentlemen and ladies.